Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I thought today we'd go over the topic of uh, how a system like Geisinger uh, responds to something as monumental and uh, world changing as COVID. And uh, as we've gone through the pandemic, as has the rest of society, as has the rest of the world, you know, we've had some learnings that I thought we'd share with you and also give you a sense of how we've thought about our response and what are some of the things that we did quickly in response. And then how did we pivot to different phases of that response as we go through the different phases of the pandemic? And also how have we leveraged some of those changes to really try to transform and make the transformation uh, lasting. And so those are some of the things we'll cover today. Uh, a little bit about us, and this gives you the agenda that I re reviewed. I think many of you are familiar with Geisinger, but I will go through a little bit about uh, the background and um, some of the nuts and bolts about the organization. Um, and then, of course, the impact of the pandemic, how we went about our post-crisis planning. And notice we didn't say post-pandemic planning. It was really post-crisis planning because there was a lot that we could do even while the pandemic was going on. Uh, but after that immediate crisis phase of the pandemic. So we'll review some of that and then get to some of these takeaway messages. So I think most of you are familiar with Geisinger. We're uh, about an $8 billion combined revenue uh, organization. And there is some accounting that removes some of that because we deal with ourselves when it comes to our health insurance and then the clinical enterprise. We actually have about 30,000, a little less than employees given um, some of the comings and goings within the organization as far as uh, markets that we no longer operate, hospitals and so forth. Um, and then we care for people. I think the best way to think about Geisinger is that we do three things. We take care of people and we take care of them in hospitals and clinics and we employ uh, 3,200 providers to do that, um, 1,800 or so of which are physicians. Uh, but the second thing we do is we cover and provide health insurance, um, and we do that for about 550,000 uh, members, um, and the footprint geographically lines up fairly well with where we have our clinical services, but it's not exactly uh, a perfect overlap, um, and that allows us actually to meaningfully partner with others outside of Geisinger as well who still deliver care uh, for these 550,000 members. Um, the last thing we do, and this is a good illustration of it, and you all, many of you all out there are uh, part and parcel of this last prong. We teach, we research, and we educate and innovate, I should say. And I think um, the best way I think about this is I, I almost think of it as we discover. Um, we discover and allow others to discover. And of course, we have our Gaman, Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine uh, with our MD curriculum and our master's curriculum. Uh, we have our nursing school, as well as many nursing learners floating throughout our system in the care delivery areas. Uh, we've always been very active in graduate medical education, our residency programs and fellowships, um, and that continues to grow as well. And we have a pretty robust research enterprise where um, some of the areas we're uh, known for probably are things like uh, genomics, um, we're starting to get more into uh, population health areas on the research side, uh, of course, clinical trials and a whole slew of other areas as well. I thought this timeline would be helpful just to bring um, the elements from the prior slide uh, to life a little bit better. So if you just took a snapshot of the last 35 years, there's been this recurring theme of Geisinger innovation. And I think it started really in 1985 with our own health plan. Um, I often say we were doing sexy before it was sexy. Um, and I know nowadays many provider entities try to get more into the financing elements of healthcare. Many health insurance companies try to get more active and influential on the delivery system side. So both you know, payer and provider, I think they're migrating and blurring the lines. Uh, in fact, we were doing that back in 1985 with the launch of our health plan. So truly remarkable. I think since then, that's been able to power many innovations along the clinical enterprise side. But at the same time, we've, we've um, done our fair share of expanding, expanding both geographically, expanding programmatically, 
and expanding to incorporate other elements within the Geisinger umbrella. Uh, obviously, the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine a few years ago, uh, the Steele Institute for Health Innovation a couple years ago. Um, and we built programs around that that start to really deliver value across all three of those buckets, whether it's our primary care scholars program, um, which we started uh, last year, or our 65 forward health centers, our senior focused primary care model, which we also launched last year. I think many of you are familiar with the primary care scholars program, but for those who aren't, uh, that's a full tuition support for up to 35, 40% of our medical school class. Uh, for every year of support, there's an expectation of a year of service back to Geisinger. We're really trying to focus on primary care um, because that's a need in our communities, but also um, have incorporated behavioral health specialties into that program as well. So really a neat model of where our education is coming together with our clinical enterprise to spark um, and for that matter, our health plan as well to spark the right kinds of um, workforce for the future of healthcare. So let's shift gears, talk a little bit about the, the impact of the pandemic. All of you have seen a graph that looks roughly like this. And, and depending on where you are, uh, the numbers themselves may actually vary a little bit, but I think the punchline to the story is pretty common. And so if you look at the blue curve here, which are the, uh, think of it as the inpatient census. So the number of patients across all of our campuses who have COVID and are admitted in the hospital. And you could see there was a big uh, peak. Uh, we peaked out a little above 120 um, sometime in mid to late April. And then during the summer months, we saw that uh, drop pretty well. And uh, of course that was a good thing. And then over the last four to six weeks, we've seen that slowly creep back up, a trend that no one likes to see, um, a trend that happens to mirror what's going on across the country, um, but also some efforts in place to try to get ahead and get upstream and ensure that trend does not keep going up in that direction. Uh, there are a lot of other um, graphs and data that we look at. Um, some that are that tend to be more leading indicators. So for example, the positive uh, testing rate or the positive uh, test volumes, we track those because typically those have been leading indicators that are fairly correlated with hospital activity over the week or two following that, that number. And so um, we could probably have a whole session devoted to data related to COVID but I thought this was perhaps the most illustrative one, at least visually on a single slide. So what did we do? You know, when we saw this hit back in uh, mid-March, um, there were several things we did fairly quickly and then some things that we've done since then. So immediately we postponed like many others, although we were fairly early in doing this, we postponed all non-urgent uh, elective visits and procedures. And, and the re reason for that was one, you needed to prepare and clear some capacity. And two, the personal protective equipment, if those of you re recall back in March, there were serious issues around and concerns around the supply chain globally. And so we certainly didn't want to be in a position where we were using those PPE, so to speak, um, for visits and surgeries that were not totally urgent um, when there was so much unknown around how much COVID there would be. So. Um, we did that fairly early on in the process. At the same time, we transitioned a lot of our employees to work from home. We reassigned or redeployed uh, over 1,500 employees from areas that had less activity to areas that had more activity. And so we were shifting folks. And I can't say enough about the resilience and adaptability of our people. Um, that was really a big part of the effort. And I would say our employees rose to the occasion and really helped us in, um, in our response effort. So big thanks and shout out to them. Uh, we also expanded virtual visits. We were going from less than 100 uh, telemedicine visits every day on average prior to COVID to um, at our peak over 4,500, almost approaching 5,000 uh, virtual visits a day. Uh, since we've reintroduced the uh, in-person uh, visits and gotten back to more normal states there, 
that number has come down a little bit, but we're still seeing 2,000 or so telemedicine visits every single day. And we think that's here to stay well beyond COVID. We love that that's here to stay because it's just a neat way to deliver care uh, that wasn't there before. Uh, we also <clears throat> were one of the first, in fact, I believe one of the first two in the entire state to have our own in-house testing capabilities, which often uh, we were able to leverage to get faster turnaround times on the test results, especially for those patients that were inpatient. We were still using a combination of outsourced lab capacity early on, and then over time, insourced the entire thing. And that's been a key part of our effort as well. There's been a lot of work on automation and digital, including most recently, uh, the use of automation and bots uh, to help us deliver the results of all those who get tested. Um, and so that's just a good illustration of ways to pivot and ways to innovate very quickly, um, because otherwise it ends up being a lot of manual effort. And as you can see with a time when you're um, uh, resource constrained because of what the virus is doing, uh, at the same time that you're still managing all the other care needs of the community, um, something like automation and bot technology have been absolutely instrumental. Also, you know, I think this is probably one that really did differentiate us, and we'll talk about it more um, later on in the presentation, but very early on, we started thinking about what's next. We started thinking about how do we plan uh, so that we can come out of this crisis and how, how do we plan so that eventually we can come out of the pandemic stronger than how we came, how we went in? How do we take advantage of some of these changes, not all of which were bad? In fact, many were were really innovative and good. Um, how do you capture that and, and stick it in a bottle and make sure that you don't lose that? And so that planning was led uh, by a cross-functional team here, and we did that fairly early on, and we'll get into that. Um, a little bit later. So some of the digital strategies, I mentioned a few of the more recent ones around returning the results. You could see the automated phone bot uh, that was helping us field a lot of incoming hotline calls. People curious, uh, patients or members or people in the community curious about COVID and should they get tested? Should they not? Should they come in for their visit? Should they not? All of those things uh, we were able to triage quite a bit, believe it or not when we launched our bot technology on that. Of course, many still talk to a live person, that's okay, but a lot of the needs we were able to field uh, simply by having a front end bot that helped us triage, helped us get some frequently asked questions answered and so forth. These are some of the other activities, uh, the website screener. Every day we would ask people uh, whether they were employees or visitors um, anybody entering one of our sites had to answer web uh, screening questions. And rather than have people um, ask them for each and every patient um, or for each and every employee, we were able to use a website that employees would fill out the screening information prior to that and just be able to show that, which made the screening process a lot faster. Um, the employee health screener was also uh, completing that same kind of thing specifically for employees versus the website screener, which had a broader audience. This gives you a sense of what we were doing and how we were doing it and the use of digital technology and strategies to, to make a lot of that easier. The, this is the results automation that I was talking about. And I probably got ahead of my skis here because the slide was coming, but here's the, uh, the feature that we just launched, believe it or not, last week. So this is brand, brand new. Um, and the idea was we get a couple hundred calls every day, um, or we make uh, several hundred calls every day to return results on people that are getting tested. They get tested for COVID, and they're waiting at home, they're anxious, they don't know what the results are. Um, we've just launched an automated result um, call service. And what we've seen between just the launch, the first couple of days, you could see it went from 201, 207 down to 140, 194. And this is all at a time when we're doing more testing. Um, but we think that a lot of the traditional calls, the manual calls where we have people from our call center uh, picking up the phones, uh, sometimes inbound, sometimes outbound. We think that volume will drop over time. 
You can also see that the results that we're delivering through the bot, you know, the first few days of this, you could see that the results um, were able to deliver 70, 80 a day uh, through the bot. And of course, that'll climb over time as well. Interestingly, you could see that more of the results are the pending results, meaning um, people are either inbound to us or we're reaching out to them, uh, typically more the inbound, uh, before the test results are ready. And our turnaround times are very, very good, um, several hours, um, and there are still places where it's several days. Um, but believe it or not, I think that demonstrates that as people are aware that this technology is there, they're trying to take advantage of it. And they're wondering, wait, is the result ready now? Is the result ready now? Well, how about now? And um, they're anxious um, and they're contacting us sooner. Um, so a lot of good wins here. Uh, it's still very early. We're going to keep track of this, but um, we're uh, less than two weeks in and seeing tremendous progress. And I think this is a good way that we're going to deliver this service without having all of the manual call volume coming in, call volume coming out, um, but rather be able to deliver these through the automation. So let's shift gears a little bit. We can talk about how we thought through and plan for the post crisis, the post immediate crisis. And as I referenced early on in the pandemic, we were actually starting to do that work. And it almost felt premature because we were still going through that peak. Um, but we thought, you know, at some point, the crisis mode of this will settle in and, and be behind us. And we don't want to be starting our planning then. And so we kicked that off fairly early. And I want to give you some snippets of what that work really entailed. And so the committee, you know, we, we set out early and we said, we want to be st stronger on the other side of this than how we went in. And we had the cross-disciplinary team, 25 senior leaders, a meeting at least once a week. In fact, I think that bullet is understating it because I happen to know um, this group was meeting several times a week and uh, encouraged to think about, well, what happens when the crisis dies down? How do we want to really be innovative around making sure we're managing um, and coming out stronger? And in fact, at the time, there was so much unknown. We thought, well, maybe we're just going to have to get good at working with and dealing with this virus for the foreseeable future. And so we wanted to be prepared for that as well. And so we'll get into what this committee, uh, some of the things that they did and recommended. So uh, we wanted to capture and, and uh, put in a bottle a lot of the positive transformations. Telemedicine is one, automation is another. You heard about some of these, but there were many, many others as well. We also wanted to plan for a healthy recovery. I mean, part of it was healthy in the sense that we wanted to keep our community safe and healthy, but also healthy, meaning fiscally and financially healthy. And that's not just Geisinger, it's also thinking about the economic uh, effects on our communities and making sure that we had that squarely in our sites as well. Also, uh, what would the new normal look like? We wanted to do some brainstorming on that and do some scenario planning because of the uncertainty the new normal, so to speak, could look like A, it could look like B, it could look like C, but we wanted to be prepared. And so that required uh, the planning. I think the key theme here is change and adapting and, and making sure that we were working differently because things were changing very quickly and we anticipated that they would continue to do so. The, this gives you a sense of all of that multidisciplinary team that I alluded to. And, and I don't know how many times you know, if you took something like um, our uh, pharmacy team, or maybe that's not a great example, um, our master facilities planning team, I don't know how often they get together with our research team, just as an example, but it just this illustrates that the, the pandemic and the crisis and the post-crisis planning brought together big organizations or areas within our organization that don't frequently otherwise come together. And so a lot of really good, thoughtful planning that incorporated the input of everybody um, in terms of the different functions within the organization. And this was some of the process. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but there was a process. We, we established different work streams. Well, what does the labor and workforce look like? What does the financial implication look like? What does the effect on the OR and the uh, elective and 
non-urgent or less urgent procedures look like? What does the health plan dynamics look like? What's the total cost of care doing? Or what um, can we do to work with employers around their premiums at a time when, you know, especially small businesses are shutting down? There was a lot of good discussion and uh, we established these work streams fairly early on in order to bring those issues to light. Um, we also did a pretty disciplined, what are we gonna start doing? But just as importantly, what are we gonna stop doing? Um, I think that um, was a key part of it as well because you only have so many resources, you only have so much bandwidth and certain things needed to get done related to COVID that weren't a part of what we were doing day to day before that. And so knowing that we had to clear some things off of people's plates, um, it never seems like it's enough, but we wanted to have those things in our hip pocket, so to speak, so that if we needed to clear some capacity, we could. Um, the other was um, evaluating and prioritizing which of these efforts made sense, which would have the greatest impact, which we could pull off mo most quickly. Um, we also identified some of the biggest ideas and, and opportunities and then created action plans and launched those things. Automation and the call center, what I described earlier, was one of the things coming out of this process and out of this group, but it illustrates um, a very thoughtful approach, I would say, um, uh, that the team put together um, around how do we come out of COVID uh, a lot stronger than how we went into COVID. And here are some of the, the questions that were asked and discussed, um, and I referenced them a little bit earlier. What, what do we all believe the new normal looks like? You know, what, what's here to stay? And what's the timeline on which we think the virus will, will eventually whack, um, sort of wane in its prominence. What are our opportunities and risks? Um, and this is that start, stop and continue exercise. Um, and what are the key actions we should take now uh, so that we're well positioned you know, two or three months from now? And so I think this was the framework of the thinking and of the discussion. And um, I think this exercise um, probably is relevant even in a normal steady state environment, but especially in the time of COVID, it became um, really critical. And here's how we thought about from a different stage or phase of this. We thought these were probably the phases we would, we would go through. And I think generally speaking, this has proven to be fairly correct. We knew that there'd be at some point a return of the less urgent work. You know, those visits and procedures that initially got postponed, uh, that were not emergent, not urgent, at some point that care need doesn't go away. We knew that that would return. And how are we gonna accommodate that? I think that was one stage we talked about. We also talked about a stage where, you know, and we put this in quotes because nothing's gonna be ever truly the pre-COVID normal. You know, I think it's fundamentally changed many facets of society. But we knew that there'd be a new sort of steady state that would get established. And, and um, as that phase set in, we wanted to make sure we had our eyes set on what those things and what those considerations should be. We also wanted to plan for a potential second wave or maybe even a third wave. And the uh, post-crisis uh, planning around um, not just when the volumes go down, but what happens when they come back up again. And, and sure enough, that's what we're going through right now is, you know, the second wave as we see case uh, volumes continue to climb. And then also, lastly, this notion of how do you make sure operationally and financially the organization and the communities are properly recovering? And how do you set yourself up for success on that? I think those are the four stages we identified. It's held relatively true um, that it feels like those are the stages we're going through. And we've often used the analogy that it truly is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and even in the marathon, and I, I wish I was a marathoner, I'm not, but those friends of mine who are, they talk about the stages of that race. And there are stages where you hit a little bit of a, what feels like a brick wall. And then there are stages where it feels like you can go on forever. I mean, this is very akin to that kind of thinking. So let's talk about each of those. And I'll just give a few highlights. I won't go through each and every slide, but uh, return of non-urgent work. We wanted to make sure because, again, there was a lot of pent-up care needs that still needed to be addressed. 
And so we wanted to uh, look at it through a population approach. How do we stratify and uh, prioritize and, and use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to predict who are the, the folks? You have, let's say, a thousand colonoscopies that have been deferred, and the number was actually significantly more than that. How do you know which ones have the highest likelihood or chance of colon cancer, in which case you got to get to them faster than others. And so we uh, leverage machine learning algorithms to help us risk stratify, to identify who within that population is most at risk. And granted, some of these are still, they're all relatively low risk, but among the low risk, who is the highest risk? Because that's who you'd want to get in first to do that colonoscopy. That was the mindset. That's what we mean when we talk about leveraging artificial intelligence, machine learning models uh, to help us risk stratify and, and, and prioritize the population. The other is we knew we had to continue to expand our, our own testing capacity so that we weren't dependent on sending it to a vendor um, and have it take days. And instead we wanted that result in hours. Um, and so uh, we pretty aggressively built out that testing capacity and in fact served as the sort of the backstop testing resource for other neighboring health systems in, in and around our area. And so uh, we were happy to do that. And that testing continues to be a big area of our focus. At the same time, we knew that when you discover that someone's positive from a prevention standpoint, we're big believers in prevention at Geisinger. And we knew that we had to do our own contact tracing. We partnered pretty closely with the state to do that. We had 24 dedicated reassigned employees um, and, and they were making over 3000 calls to try to do some of that contact tracing. I think it was a key part of the community effort. And the reason why I think this was more natural for us was because remember I mentioned we've had our own health insurance company for 35 years. And so we have a team of people that have always been focused, as it turns out, on prevention and outreach calls and so forth. And it was very natural for them to pivot and now do outreach calls on everybody who was positive for COVID and talking to them about who else they may have been in close contact with and then calling them and, and alerting them and so forth. And so um, I think we were able to leverage some of our existing capabilities and mindset um, in some of these efforts. And so um, I think this is an important point because we talked to many of our colleagues, other health systems across the country. And I'll tell you that there's a little bit of a philosophical uh, split where most health systems, hospitals certainly, uh, would say their job stops at the hospital door. So unless somebody is a patient, they don't feel like that's their job or their role to get into things like contact tracing or get into things like going out and educating the uh, staff at nursing homes. Um, I think they would feel like, you know, that's the public health infrastructure's job. That's the state public health department's job. At Geisinger, we're very different. And I think it gets to the mindset of when you have a health plan, you're, you're sort of wired around prevention. You're wired to go upstream. You're wired to try to improve the health of uh, an entire population as opposed to waiting until they become your patient. And so um, it illustrates how we were in some ways uniquely positioned to do some of this work. The return to the new normal. We talked about this, I won't belabor it, but this gives you some additional detail. What do we stop doing? How do we start doing certain things and what do we need to do? Um, and then how do we continue to expand? You know, And maybe I'll focus on the continue and expand part because we wanted to make sure that digital was here to stay and automation was here to stay. We actually wanted to make sure that work from home, my goodness, what a neat benefit because now you could recruit people, they could literally be anywhere for certain kinds of jobs and they could still be employees of Geisinger. And so um, even on the other side of COVID, we think at least 20% of our workforce will be work from home um, either in its entirety or in some hybrid way where they may come in physically one day a week, something like that. Um, but as a, as a result of that, we think there's huge opportunity on expanding our workforce, expanding the tent, so to speak, to accommodate more people, not to mention the convenience 
of not having to commute and so forth. And so there's a lot here, um, but that's another good example of something we wanted to make sure we continue and expand. Um, also, we, we were very aggressive on communication. During the height of the pandemic, we had at least, and sometimes more, but at least three internal uh, virtual town halls every week. And then we had at least one public virtual press conference every week. Now we've since been able to space that out where now we're doing it more once a month or so. Um, but that ability to get several thousand people on a town hall at the same time, uh, we think that's another neat way to continue to communicate even beyond COVID, communicate our strategy, communicate key initiatives, communicate why we're investing in certain capabilities or programs or spaces. Um, and so that's something that we've uh, really thought should also continue to expand. Um, getting deep with our community, swimming upstream, um, leveraging programs that keep people in the home and we're still able to touch them. Remote patient monitoring is a good example of that. Of course, telemedicine and virtual visits, good example of that. Our mail order pharmacy, which we were doing prior to COVID, just went into a different gear because people appreciated more the convenience of getting their maintenance medications just dropped on their doorstep every 90 days. Um, all of these things were tremendous. I think the other is the payment model, the ability to have our own health plan and focus really on wellness and populations as opposed to having to do something or do a service or do a procedure. Um, but instead, we could focus the doing on the prevention side. Um, I think that really hit home for a lot of folks as well. Although, of course, that's something we've had going on for over three decades, as I mentioned earlier. The second wave, anticipating what that second wave looks like and how we think about um, being prepared. So we had a lot of predictive analytics. I, I mentioned to you, um, as we brought back those non-urgent services, we were able to prioritize which tranche would go first, which would go second, what kinds of procedures. Uh, if we ever had to um, dial things back down, what kinds of procedures do we think are most appropriate? to do that without delaying care unnecessarily, continuing to expand our testing. The upstream is what I call this third bullet. I think that is very, very key. If there's a single take home message from today, I think that's one of them. We went upstream very early and we stayed there and we're still there. And that means, again, philosophically, we're different than a lot of hospitals. That means we're getting out into those nursing homes even though we don't own and operate them. There are over 250 nursing homes. We have gone out and done assessments on their infection control policies and training and making sure that their staff feel comfortable with what's the right situation to don what kind of PPE and how do you make sure the hand hygiene is up to snuff and are there things you have to do with the space or the uh, airflow and all of those things were part and parcel of our effort. We also got out with over a dozen local chambers of commerce and uh, a lot of small businesses in particular um, had questions as they were ready to go back and open their doors. This is back in May. They were curious, well, how do I do this safely? How do I do this safely for my employees and for those who visit me? And uh, we were able to step in and offer a lot of assistance. We even had a toolkit that we offered online. Um, anybody can come and, and grab the things that they needed for free. And it had sort of policies and ways to approach things. It even had uh, the ability to print your own kind of things to put on the ground as stickers of how to uh, direct traffic and so forth. Um, we also got very active in the local schools, both uh, primary, uh, uh, primary um, uh, school and uh, high school, but also universities. And so uh, we've been lucky to be a, a strong partner there for many of the educational institutions throughout our area. We also, um, and, and this is another really cool kind of machine learning thing, we also partnered with a vendor of ours uh, called Stanson, who does a lot of decision support and best practice alerts for electronic medical records. But we, uh, in partnership with them, we developed an early warning surveillance system that would essentially troll through the medical record, um, even in the past or currently, and 
identify folks who are at higher risk for um, getting severely ill with COVID or identify folks who are at higher risk of potentially having COVID and maybe not having symptoms, but perhaps they need to be tested. Um, because the symptoms could really be so many things. And I think if you're uh, just somebody in the community and you're waiting for a fever or a cough before you even start thinking COVID, but believe it or not, it could be manifesting through other ways. We wanted to know that, especially if they were patients of ours and we had that data in the electronic medical record. And so we had a system where we were searching for those things actively and if we found anybody who might actually have it and not realize, we would proactively take uh, action and recommend that they be tested. Um, it gives you another snippet into the kinds of things we were doing. Certainly not an exhaustive list, but it gives you that uh, sampling of the kinds of activities we uh, think about when we mention these uh, stages. The economic recovery. So if you're a care delivery system, in our case, our clinical enterprise, the impact was about $500 million um, over the um, several months that we were in the height of the pandemic. So up until about June, July, let's say. Um, and that's a negative impact. So that's a pretty astronomical impact. Now, some of that was mitigated and offset by uh, the government relief dollars. So we're super thankful for that, but it didn't get rid of the whole thing, far from it. Um, and then of course, having our own health insurance, you know, the cost of care did go down because um, less people were getting those elective procedures and so forth. And so there's a little bit of a natural hedge there, but even that probably offset maybe a quarter, maybe a fifth, um, but certainly not all of this. So uh, net net, the organization did have a fairly significant negative financial impact. Um, obviously, uh, that's something we continue to keep our eyes on. And we have to make sure if there is the second wave, and I think we've learned a lot, and now there is the second wave. I think the good thing is we're, we're going to be able to modulate it a little bit better and hopefully manage our capacity a little bit better and, and know where we could have surge capacity and and fit in folks who still need to get other services and care, um, but still manage the COVID. We're gonna need to walk and chew gum at the same time is what that means. Um, and that'll help with the economic recovery. But remember, I mentioned earlier, it's not just Geisinger. This is about the economic recovery in our communities. And, and I don't know where you all live, but in some of the communities where we operate, uh, you drive through some of these strip malls and there are empty storefronts now that were not there in February uh, during pre-COVID. There were stores in those storefronts and there were restaurants in those storefronts. And, and we know that a lot of that um, sort of uh, COVID impact has negatively impacted small business. And if you're talking about many of the areas that we serve, small business dominates the economy. And so it's something we're keeping our eyes on and in fact, uh, doing what we can to continue to um, contribute and to continue to support and to continue to drive economic activity simply from our own growth, but also when we look at um, how can we uh, stay active in our communities. Um, Value-based care is the other, you know, continuing to expand the populations that we manage within our health plan, because we've seen that that really helps to um, stabilize the financial picture and to focus on prevention. And so um, we have seen, and much has been written about, and I'll put it in quotes, the fragility of fee-for-service payment models within healthcare. You know, health systems being so dependent on those procedures and those elective things um, in order to have the cash flow to continue to operate. Well, if you were in more of a prepaid or a global budget scenario, um, meaning you're charged with a population and you have to keep them healthy, sort of like how we think about things on the insurance side, that's been a more stable financing model and a sustainable financing model to still be able to power all those programs that I referenced earlier that help keep people healthy. Um, so that gives you some of the themes around the financial and operational aspect. So let me wrap up by just summarizing some of the key takeaways. 
I think um, as much as it's been tremendously disruptive, um, there have been a lot of silver linings in this cloud of COVID as well. And we thought it's um, good to highlight some of them. I think um, the speed and the ability to adapt has been shocking to people. And I think um, when you think about, well, why can't we do that uh, in a normal state? Well, I think it has to do with focus. COVID taught us, if nothing else, that when you focus and when the entire community and the organization is focused on one thing, you could do a lot and you could do it really quickly. And um, I think that's been one of the key takeaways. Another is um, we can transform and we can do it quickly and efficiently. Part of it, it gets to focus, but part of it is Sometimes people say, well, there's a lot of inertia. We have habits. You know, we, we revert back to those habits. Yes, 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 and yes. But um, at the same time, we've seen that when we put a, put a flag out there and uh, have our 30,000 strong go after it, they're pretty good at going after it. And so I think we should um, celebrate that because that's been something we have observed during COVID. I think innovation is another key, key area um, you got to get creative. You got to get resourceful. You got to think about problems differently. You have to rethink your routine. And part of it is incorporating technology like digital transformation, the automation that I talked about, obviously virtual care, the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to help prioritize and to leverage our data capabilities. Um, I think the other is moving care closer to the communities, meeting people where they're at. And this is something near and dear to my heart because when we set out on our new strategy or our revamped strategy at Geisinger for the next chapter of Geisinger, and this is well before COVID, this is a year and a half ago, we said that what we're setting out to do is not build it and expect people to come, but build programs, build capabilities and meet people where they're at and push care out into the communities and closer to people's homes. And so that's been a, a key win out of COVID is that those programs that we built along those lines, they kicked into a different gear. And so we're super happy about that. And then of course the payment models, focusing on populations, um, value-based payments so that you could really deploy resources upstream and talk about risk um, or talk about wellness because you have the financial risk um, when they're not well I think that starts aligning incentives around total health. And then the last thing that I reference, but want to just reiterate communication. As much as this has been a clinical battle, it has been a battle of communication as well. I mentioned all the town halls, I mentioned all the uh, press conferences. So both internally and externally, uh, we've been very aggressive on the communication side. I think we will continue to do that. Um, but even well beyond COVID, the value of being able to communicate frequently and to communicate transparently with what, what um, the organization is focused on and working on, and more importantly, the why, um, that's a big part of the takeaway as well. Something that we always knew conceptually made sense, but very quickly, we mobilized a way to do that virtually and get thousands of people on a town hall together. That I, I think that would have taken us a lot longer if it weren't for COVID. And so those are some of the things that um, I thought were worth sharing. Um, but I want to thank all of you for your interest. I want to thank you for bearing with us through these last 45 minutes. And, um, you know, obviously, if you all have any thoughts or questions, I hope this has been informative to you. Uh, but you could always reach out as well. But thank you so much and uh, hope to see you all soon.